What you're looking at is the archaeological dig site of the structural remains of the two-story stone house that was built by George Fairbanks and the Bogusto farmers back in 1657. Uh, we started looking for this site back in 2005. It took about three years to find it. Uh, and in 2008, I was about 90% certain I had found the site uh, using the maps and what documentation has survived the last three and a half centuries. And so we, we spoke with the, the property owners, John and Sylvia Constable, about ending off a bus tour down here that was being put on by the Millis Historical Society of the, um, the nine different home sites of the Bargasto farmers west of the river and end off the bus tour down here. Well, the day before the event, I came down to erect a, a sign that was to be a replica of a sign that had been put up uh, at around 1903. We don't know where that sign was, but we do have a, we did create a replica of it. Um, and in the process, as I was digging the post holes for the sign, I came up out of the ground with physical evidence of the fort. So I went from being about 90% certain that that was the site of the fort to 100% certain in one fell swoop. I came up out of the ground with, with wrought iron nails and brick fragments and charcoal. So I, I knew we had something. This is the first stone we unearthed that was actually part of the part of the structural remains. We had, after we knew that we were on the site, I went around with the the iron soil probe in the in the manner of Roland Robbins back in the 1950s uh, to find out, you know, to, to get the stone strikes because we knew it was a, a stone structure. And the strikes indicated that I had a wall here. So several test holes along this line were very telling. But this stone here was particularly interesting because it has the, it's a beautiful, nice big old flag stone with a 90 degree angle on both sides, all four sides actually. Um, and this was the first one that we uncovered when basically the, the, the first place we were able to see that we were definitely on the fort and we were just gonna apply the biased digging technique. In other words, go from what you know. And we knew that it would proceed this way. So basically we just opened up the entire east-west running north wall. And uh, when we get down to the end, it was a little difficult. We didn't know. <laughs> it was hard to determine which direction the uh, the side walls ran. We didn't see evidence. You know, all we had over there was, as you can see, those tennis ball-sized field stones, which is the only remaining evidence of the west wall. And we weren't picking up anything over here coming north. And the same thing was happening down here over the cellar wall, the corner of the, the uh, northeast corner of the cellar, there was, you know, of course, that's so far down, I wasn't picking anything up with the soil probe. Uh, basically, we initially thought that perhaps the wall ended here, but that was a lot shorter than what Morse has indicated. He said 65, 70 feet long, this structure was, but it sure wasn't from here 
to there. Of course, once we found the cellar and the, the, the outside corner of the cellar over there, we, you know, the, the length extended another 15 feet, but um, we had the same issue over here. We didn't know which direction the side wall went. This stone here, it was the first stone we found along this partition, or what actually turned out to be the west wall of the cellar. Um, we found it, and then I think Charlie, my son, and actually my wife, they were working over here, and they found this and then this. And it wasn't long before we realized that we had several rocks right next to each other that were probably the top course of a wall, which was very exciting. Um, and so shortly thereafter, we proceeded to open up all of them. But before we finished, before we got up to the, you know, the stone of the first unit that we had opened, exposing the top of the whole west wall of the cellar, we, we did some investigating down in here and over there on the west, on the uh, east wall of the cellar. And I recall it was the 4th of July. My son Charlie was working here, and I was working over there, and we both discovered evidence of walls, new undiscovered walls up to that point the same day. He found this wall, and I was over there, and I found that wall right on the same day. And we had, we were opening this wall, because we could see here, the courses just went down, down, down. We weren't really sure what was going on here, but this is why we went down here. And this is basically why this wall was discovered. The only reason I chose to go down over there, and as you can see, the top course of that east cellar wall is nearly four feet below grade. Uh, typically, you know, an investigator is going to stop unless, you know, they have clear evidence that there's something down there. Um, the only evidence I had that there might be something there was that the earth was just digging like butter. It seemed clear to me that it had been dug before. I mean, I'm an old Title V inspector from years back, and I can pretty much tell when earth has been dug before I've gotten there. And this earth seemed like it had already been dug, so I just kept going down. And sure enough, about three and a half, four feet down, I picked up the face side of these stones that make up the east wall of the cellar. And man, we had found two separate walls of the cellar on the same day. And we didn't know that they were cellar walls. All we knew was they were stone walls. The first unit that we opened up that was actually within the confines of the cellar walls, uh, we exposed a bunch of rubble, or small stone fill, if you will, that we didn't really know what to think. At first, I thought it might have been a well, a wellhead, you know, of a well that had been filled in after it was abandoned, which is typically what they do. And it was kind of exciting because you know, abandoned wells is where you will find all kinds of interesting artifacts. And so it was pretty exciting. Until we started opening up surrounding units around it to give it some context and to find the, the outer walls of it, all of the units presented with the exact same rubble. And so we had like a, a, a nine foot, a nine meter square that had just this rubble fill. And you can tell not only because of the fact that it was, you know, brick fragments and, and fragments of this type of stone, which are not indigenous to the field and some field stones, but in between all these rocks, there were air voids and whatnot, where you can tell right away that it, it's been filled. It's a hole that's been filled. And it wasn't long after that that we figured we were probably in a cellar. We didn't know how far down it was going to go, but it was going to be fun to find out.
Once we opened up the cellar completely, uh, there was a, a good amount of discussion about the possibility of it actually being a, a later addition. We, we really were never able to figure that out on our own. Um, if you look over here, and look how these stones are intermingled. You get crossed this way, they're crisscrossed as they came up with the wall, which makes for a beautiful corner um, between this wall and this wall. Although this wall, this east-west running north wall, does not go down this deep. It only goes down this deep underneath this partition wall. The cellar wall starts flush with this intermingled section of stones here. It goes out this way, all the way out and stops. And in it, inside of it, this wall here starts flush of it. Again, there's no intermingling of the stones, which is curious because, you know, why if they were gonna do it here, they're gonna build such a beautiful stone wall here or corner rather, why not do it the same way here? So this was an indication that perhaps it was a different period of construction, but we didn't know. Um, and you know, it just came out the same way and terminated flush with this wall right here. Again, no intermingling of stones at the corner. And the same thing here. Um, also, if you'll notice, these rocks that come out right at the center of this 21 foot wall. Um, we had a feeling that this this was something. We, when you get down four feet and you see rocks like this, what was on top of it was just, you know, fill. And so once I saw these that were embedded right in the, the silty clay and this one here next to it, and I noticed that they were right smack dab in the middle of this east cellar wall. I looked up and I said to Charlie, take a look at this. What do you want to bet there's a third one right here? Before I opened it, the unit had ended was here. You have to understand, this was, this was an earth wall right here. So I had these two, but this is how it worked. You know, you pick up clues. And I had a feeling there was a third one coming out here. And sure enough, when we opened up this unit and came down and found this and this, we knew that there was some sort of a, a median, they represented some sort of median axis support for the center of the, of the, uh, of the cellar. Planks probably coming across like this and uh, being supported here and again like that. And so that was interesting and helpful when we try to uh, determine exactly what was going on here. Uh, the unit that was open here <coughs> was opened by Paul Hogan of Medfield, one of our volunteers, a pretty hard worker. Uh, and he happened to notice when he was exposing this the east face of this west wall, a stain down at a 45 degree angle right here before this stone here was exposed he saw a stain on the rocks and he brought it to my attention and we decided that it was probably uh, rotting wood that had stuck to the stone wood that was perhaps part of a stairway of you know a trapdoor egress down into the cellar which terminated at this landing stone and this was all later confirmed by Chad Baker of Salem State College, who is really quite the authority. Uh, and so that was, that was important and very interesting. Uh, at one point, we, with this absence of rocks here, we thought perhaps that there was a, like a bulkhead walk-in to the cellar and so we opened that unit there, but as we got down, maybe once we got down like a foot and a half below grade, we could see that we were just in virgin earth and hard pan and obviously earth that had not been dug before. And, and so we sort of abandoned that theory 
probably just several rocks that have been knocked out as wall stones for somehow when they robbed what stones they did rob to use elsewhere around the property. This was probably one of the wall stones and this one here also. Um, but if you'll notice, the interior of all these stone walls are made up of faced stone. All of the, the, the stones along the wall have been faced. They've been physically, they've been chiseled and, and hacked so that it would be a flat surface. And when you put them all together, it makes a very nice wall. Um, and that's the case with all four walls. The outside of the wall was, you know, just natural, predominantly like bullet shaped. They had no reason to face off both sides of the stone because there's no cellar over here. This is this is the, this is the basically the top course of the cellar wall, as this would be floor level here. And so only one side of the stones were faced off. And whether they were faced off on site or whether they were faced off where they quarried these stones from, it's hard to say. I don't think these stones came out of this field because we've sunk test units all over this field. And this type of stone that makes up the entire stone structure, not to mention the fireplace and all of the walls, just do not present themselves in this field. They don't seem to be indigenous to this field. Um, Morse might be correct when he said they were actually quarried and brought in from about a mile north. Well, either way, they don't seem to have been indigenous to this field. Um, this is kind of a close-up of the east face of the cellar's west wall. Look at the beautiful stonework here by these guys from the mid 17th century. Walls don't get any straighter than this, by the way. Kind of in the shadow, so it's a little difficult to see. Let's see if I can pick up a brighter section and zero in a little bit. The stones are beautifully interlaid. The angles of these stones almost fit together like Legos. Very, very sturdy. The next feature that we discovered was the dual fireplace. Uh, of course, as we were exposing the north wall, you know, to give it context, you, you, you try to expose the edges of it. Of course, there was no edge here. You just kept finding stones. And although these these are appear to be randomly smattered stones, these are not. These were placed by design, and so were these. And so we knew we had another feature here. We didn't know what it was. You know, none of this was completely open at the time. But eventually we exposed this beautiful dual fireplace um, and we knew it as such because we've got fire damage rock here with water stones in between a second fireplace with fire damage rocks over there. And you get some of these beautiful heart stones right here. I'm amazed that they've survived the three centuries of plowing. And then these heart stones here. And there's enough surviving that we're going to be able to we're going to be able to put this together on a on a drafting board, and we're going to be able to show you exactly what this fireplace looked like for the most part. Um, this was the larger fireplace because here's the corner of the pit of this fireplace. The corner of the pit of this other fireplace is here. So this was this is I think this is like eight feet across and this one was more like six feet across and it really is a, a wonderful example of mid 17th century 
you know, colonial American vernacular architecture with the, you know, the hall and parlor arrangement and the centralized chimney placement. It's just, it's right out of these books of early colonial architecture. It's a wonderful example. According to Morse, who wrote the history of Sherman and Holliston, this structure was entered from the south end. Now, I'm not sure I'd call the, the south wall the end of the structure, but it, it was entered from the south. Uh, and this would have been where you would enter the structure. And Tad Baker confirms this. You would come in, and there would be a, a probably a brick partition here with a door leading into the hall area. And over here, there would probably be another brick partition with a door leading into the parlor area. And directly in front of you would have been the stairway to the second floor, which was probably like this. You know, you would, you would walk straight ahead and begin to go up the stairs here. And as they turned, you would be walking up the stairs right here. Uh, the supporting members of the stairs tying right into the bricks of the, the fireplace. And it wasn't very wide. And the supporting members of the staircase were probably, were probably actually part and parcel of the stones that made up the fireplace. And so if one thing moved, the other thing moved. Hunter, the caretaker of Millborn Farm right now. He's been very, very helpful, uh, telling us all about how it's, it's so clay and, and wet on the upland of the farm, and anytime we need something, Marshall just, he's a peach. He helps us out no matter what we need. Um, can you think of anything else? Know that you're going to cry when I bury you. <laughs> we fill this in, but that right. won't be for a while. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's... So, uh, anyway. The parlor was where most of the living was done. You know, the evenings, cooking, most everything of everyday life was done in this room. Uh, traditionally, the parlor room was where the family would meet, maybe have friends over after, after Sunday sermon, and you know, they would dress up and just sit and relax and maybe smoke a pipe and relax in this room. But that's not exactly what this room was used for by these guys. These stones here that appear to be just large field stones that form this three foot square formation apparently are the base of what was known as a bloomery. Bloomery was a very early form of iron making. Typically, that's the form they would use out in the early colonies out in the wilderness when they wanted to make wrought iron. They would create a bloomery and make wrought iron from the local bog ore. Of course, we didn't know what these stones were when we first exposed them. I mean, when you, you know, you can expose a field stone and and, you know, in the middle of a field, it's not going to mean anything. But when we found two right next to each other, and then a third and a fourth, and we, we cleared around to give it some context, and we could see that it did indeed form almost like a, a, a three-foot square or three-and-a-half by three-square formation. And along the, the south side and the east side, going down three feet, three-and-a-half feet below grade, was slag and early nails by the hundreds and miscellaneous iron of all sorts. What we later learned to be was the debris pit of this bloomery. And it's one of the very telltale signs of a bloomery. And so we knew that a small scale iron manufacturing operation was going on here. We didn't know, I didn't know exactly what type at first. In fact, we sat on this slag for about a year before we researched it in earnest. Once we did start to research it, I sent a, I found the name Bob Gordon, who wrote 
early American iron, 1607 to 1900. And Bob Gordon, the guy who wrote the book, claims to be able to tell from where, from what type of operation a piece of slag has come through just by cutting the slag open and looking at it through a microscope. Uh, I got his contact information and I emailed him. He's a professor down at Yale University. He's in his 80s. And I basically challenged him to prove his claim in the book. And he was tickled with the opportunity to take our slag. He agreed. He took our slag. He looked at it. And less than a week later, he had emailed me. And he told me that this is bloomery slag. Where are you? <laughs> because he knew a few if any, bloomery sites in New England. So from that point, I stopped and started researching some more about all the different, the earliest bloomery sites in the country. And some very early sites existed down in Williamstown, Virginia, but nobody talks about an actual base of a bloomery. They claim that the site was where it was because of the debris pit. But after a lot of research, it seemed like I was the only one, we were the only ones who had the actual base of the bloomery. We knew exactly where it was. So we've got iron making out in this vicinity, and our re research has led us to conclude that it was probably taking place in the 1640s. Um, only because uh, it's bloomery slag. They were obviously making iron out here. <laughs> they obviously were early enough to get under the radar of all of the history writers of the day. Because none of the history writers talk about iron ma making in any way, shape, or form in any of the four towns, whether it be Medfield or Sherbin or Millis or Medway. None of them talk about iron making, even Dedham. Very, very few items on that subject. And so, It almost seems like they were going out of their way to keep, let me put it this way, it's hard enough doing research on the history that's three and a half centuries old under the best of circumstances. Very challenging. But when the guys who are involved in the activity that you're interested in were going out of their way to keep all indications of what they were doing off the books. Unless you have physical evidence of the activity, don't even waste your time because you'll never prove it. So why did these guys go out of their way to keep this bloomery operation out of the history books? Well, probably because by operating a bloomery out here, they were committing crimes against the crown. You weren't allowed to take raw materials and manufacture them into finished products over here in the colonies uh, from, from the earliest times right on through to almost revolutionary period. So they would not have wanted everybody to know what they were doing. Um, the West Wall, which as you can see, doesn't really seem to be much other than these tennis ball sized field stones. Uh, it's, it's basically all the evidence we have of the West Wall. So it makes the structure actually only about 45 feet long when you're talking about, you know, stone footings. Um, this unit here, where there don't appear to be any stones, was basically the first unit that was opened up along the line of this West Wall. And I have to be frankly honest, and when I got down to the level of these stones, I didn't know what they were. I didn't recognize them as a feature. So I had removed four or five of them, you know, in my uh, efforts to get down to the next level, probably the 20 centimeter level, because they did not appear to be obvious features. And I got down there and we found some charcoal that sort of started here and went across like this, which kind of indicated that perhaps there was a, a, um, a bearing member, a wooden bearing member here, which burnt and fell in. But the stones, I think, provide us with a very interesting insight into the way these guys thought 
with respect to the uh, the frost line and how far down they needed to go to not worry about frost beams. This is as far down as wall evidence goes. It's not that far down. It looks like they just put these stones here. They went around and collected these stones, all of roughly the same size, and probably just hand tamped them into place as hard as they could, and then laid the stones of the type that you see along the north wall on top. Now I say that because these same stones exist underneath that north wall. And so we're thinking that's, that's what they did. Um, before I get too far along, I just wanted to, now that I'm looking at these, the bricks, these bricks right here along the north side of the bloomery base are evidence that there was a brick lining on the outside of the bloomery. There was probably a brick lining on the inside and the outside with sand or some sort of other earth fill in between as insulation for the very hot, hot temperatures that would be reached to, um, to smelt the iron ore inside this thing. The other interesting feature of this section is this rock here. We don't know what this is. We, this could have been any number of things from a, a threshold to a door leading out right here to a lintel that was over the door or, you know, even a, you know, a mantelpiece that was, you know, originally over the fireplace. It's hard to say what this is, but it's a very interesting and large stone. When we had Tad Baker down here about two weeks ago, uh, I asked him in particular about this feature here, which we haven't spoken of yet. This line of bricks that are just one brick right after the other, and it's kind of an unusual formation You've got two courses of them, and they're just lying there. Nobody among our volunteers really had any idea of what this was. And so, you know, we'd gone back and forth a good amount. But Tad Baker came down a couple weeks ago, and he saw it. He said, this, these bricks are the remains of a brick fire back that came up like this. These stones here are the hot stones of a pr very primitive fireplace. And so that was a big revelation to us. We didn't have a clue that this was a fireplace and this was perhaps an earlier structure. He asked me about the artifacts that we've been unearthing, in particular the tobacco pipe evidence. And what I told him indicated to him and confirmed with him that okay you're finding the older artifacts out in the vicinity of this more primitive structure he said that jives the other aspect of the fireplace that we haven't really discussed is the the beehive oven uh there probably would have been a beehive oven right here because you're in the the hall area the larger of the two areas beehive oven would have been right here next to this fireplace getting heat from this fireplace and being hooked into the same smoke conveyance so this is where the beehive oven would have been and you can see charcoal at the floor level this is the last this is the lowest level of uh, any sort of um, human inhabitant evidence the, um, the level of charcoal was probably about two inches thick, inch and a half to two inches thick, all throughout the interior of this section. We found charcoal evidence of tongue and groove planking, which was important. On top of the layer of charcoal were most of the brick fragments that we've unearthed. Uh, the bricks, we, haven't, we don't have too many whole bricks. But the brick, I took a whole brick and I brought it over to the Dwight Derby house to compare it to the bricks over in the partitions of the Dwight Derby house in Medfield. And not only was the color of the brick exactly the same, but the length and width and the thickness of the bricks were also exactly the same. So there's an excellent chance that the bricks of the Dwight Derby house and the bricks of this house came from the same clay, the same clay fit perhaps. 
And it also tells us that the floorboards burned first. We don't believe that the entire structure burned. We have a line on the dismantling of the structure, but we haven't finished our research there. But we believe, obviously, there was a fire because there's charcoal. We think the floorboards burnt and the clay bricks inside the structure fell, and that explains the bricks on top of the charcoal. Now, among the brick remains, we found also um, daubing from wattle and daub systems in the wall for insulation. Uh, Tad Baker confirmed the identification of the daubing. We suspected it, but he confirmed it. And then he also confirmed what we didn't know was bits of mortar, probably ancient lime mortar, which we found way below the organic fraction of the soil, which is probably the only reason they still survive. Uh, and that was important. Um, the other thing we talked about was the roof. We didn't know what kind of roof this structure had. No one had ever talked about that. There was basically three types of roofs that it could have been back then. Uh, slate, clapboard, or thatch. After we did a, quite a fair amount of digging, we found no evidence of slate that would have been roofing slate. Plus, Tad said, you probably wouldn't see a slate roof out here on a structure that was this early. It's probably, that, that sort of roof was typically used on the, you know, the more finer houses near the coast. So, those two things pretty much ruled out a slate roof. We said, okay, well, it could be thatched, but who would put a thatched roof on a balloon roof? Who in their right mind? would put a thatched roof on top of a blooming. It made no sense. So before we even got done talking about it, we figured we knew what kind of roof it had. It was a clapper roof. Makes perfect sense. We found many, many nails of about an inch and a half long, which would be the, typically the size nail that you would nail clapper down. None of these nails were, were um, banged over. You know, as you might do if the point of a nail comes into a living structure, you want to bang it over so nobody catches themselves. All these nails were just, none of them have been crimped over, so you wouldn't have to worry about it for a roof anyway. So we believe that this was a clapping roof. top of this iron stake, which was installed by John Anderson and Charles Hardy of Anderson Engineering over in Walpole, represents datum. Datum is the sea level value of grade level before we started any digging.
Yeah, it's quite a sight. A lot of work. Don't let them kid you. Archaeology is a lot of work. And the pond out there beyond the trees. A pile of stones that came out of the cellar over there in the background. In a four foot deep cellar. There's a screen, one of them, that we screened all of the earth that was pulled out of that site, except for the, the stones that we threw out of the cellar onto that pile next to the cellar. Tons and tons of earth were screened with this screen, and some very amazing artifacts were found. Boy, that's when history comes alive, when you see a, the light green patina of a, of a coin that predates 1700, or a, the peace pipe pendant, or all the different things we found there. The, the glazed pottery, the nails, window glass, you name it. We all took it off that screen, or the other one that was on the other side of the site. That's where history comes alive.